Now, right, due to certain reasons, we're gonna go ahead and read the books now instead of waiting. Alright, so let's do this. Oh god, that's a lot, so it's gonna be a reading part. History of the Bell in the Depths. Oh, wait. Is this about, like, the Dark Souls bell, you know? The one you have to ring in Blythown? Anyway. One of the great and mysterious sights in the Moon Sea area is the Bell in the Depths. It's connected with legendary Northkeep, an island kingdom that was the first great citadel of humankind in these cold lands. North Keep was a great and magical city, and it was under the protection of these magics that humanity first began to press back the orc hordes and take command of the sea. The power of North Keep made it an obvious target for orcs, giants, and other evil races. However, these creatures were not inclined towards sea actions, and North Keep seemed safe until the day when, according to legend, 40,000 inhuman mages, shamans, witch doctors, and priests of all foul races gathered on the northern shore of the moon sea and began to chant, bringing the vengeance of their gods down upon the human interlopers. The gods, at least some of them, came and destroyed their priests for disturbing them, but also sang Norhi beneath the waves. Uh, typical. The upper reaches of North Keep, its slender, now broken spires, can be seen beneath the water by boats that sail nearby. This is not attempted often, however, as the region is said to be haunted by the original defenders of North Keep, seeing company in their watch over the cold lands. On fog-ridden nights, the bells of the tallest towers, despite being submerged, can be heard as far away as hills fall. So the depths, they mean actual water depths, not just depths. Okay, next is History of the Last March of the Giants. East of the Great Rift in the Eastern Shah once stood a land of the Titans. This empire rose at the dawn of time in Faroon, and its lords thought to challenge the gods in their arrogance. In punishment, the powers cursed the reigning monarch of the land with fascination and his brethren with devotion. What? The powers then dropped the star onto the land. The impact of the fallen star created a huge valley, later known as the Sea of Fallen Stars. Slowly picking up speed, the ball rolled through the Titan nation and onward to the south. What the hell are you even talking about? Unable to contain his curiosity, the Titan King ran off after the bouncing sphere and his devoted followers dutifully followed his tracks. The meteorite rolled on and on until it reached the great sea and vanished into the depths. Uh, those are same depths. The monarch dove into the sea, and lemming-like, the entire titan raised Doe in after him, never to be seen again. Ashamed at the destruction they had wrought, the powers vowed to keep both curiosity and loyalty firmly in check to avoid such disasters in the future. They have done so to this day, preventing both new ideas from being pursued with any speed, and the intelligent races of Toril from ever fully cooperating. These fucking stories are weird as shit, man. Let's read some history instead. History of Shadowdale. We're, we're missing the first 11 tomes, but I'm pretty sure they're, they're not important, right? Right? Charles and Morgan meet and marry. Oh, dear. The implications of Kelben Blackstaff Aronson choosing the last two lords of Shadowdale. Dow Silwood and Morgrim Amcathra. What the hell? You should have chosen names that are better than this. We're not lost on the Dale's powerful neighbor to the south, Cormir. An agent was sent northward to divine Morgrim the oh god. True intentions and to guarantee the Dale's continued good relationship with the throne of the purple dragon. What the? F Seriously? What the hell happened in the first 11 books? If they're this long, like, what the hell? An agent was a rogue named Charles Rowan Mendel, sent by Vander de Haast, Vanger de Haast, what the fuck? The whole paperwork on this matter has been curiously incinerated in Suzale, so all this her say and tale. Cheryl discovered more than she intended and fell in love with young Mongrim. The two married and became the Lord and Lady of Shadowdale. Cheryl's loyalty is now to her husband and the land they co-rule. This was probably not the intention of Cormirians. Yep. Yep. Okay, Morgrim's rule. Do they? 
Since being recommended to the position by outgoing Lord Dowsilwa, Lord Morngrim and Cathra's rule of Shadowdale has been less peaceful than he had hoped. The first battle of Shadowdale occurred in the year of the prince, 1357 DR, whatever that means. Dice roll, <laughs> And involved Dale land forces routing the, those of Liren the Pretender. Liren has made repeated attempts to gain the lordship, as was intended by the former Zendish puppet Lord Jordan. Oh. While significant this battle pales when compared to the larger battle fought on the same side between Bane led Sintil keep forces and the Dales during the time of troubles, one three five eight uh dice roll zero uh pretzel roll. Yeah. That's what these things mean. I'm a professional on this. When the Battle of Shadowdale is referred to without a number, it is usually means the second battle. In addition, Morngrim has had to deal with a large number of skirmishes, incursions, and possible invasion from below, explosions, and other sundry disasters. Okay. Morngrim and Cheryl have one child, Scotty. Scotty. Oh yeah, Scotty. Who is now nine winters old. Why is it winters? You should be, like, happy about this shit, like, say, summer's old or something. By the customs of the area, he is not considered the heir apparent, and another suitable warrior or mage may take the reins of power of the small community. Most feel that Morngrim will hold the pendant until his son has reached his maturity, then abdicate in young Scottish favor once he takes his crown name. If this happens, it will be the first occasion of the lordship of Shadowdale passing down to a family. Ooh, whatever. I mean, I get it. Winters. Because winters are cold and dark and it's hard to live through them in the past. But still, that's, that's just sad. Remember this? History of the Moon Sea. Oh my god. The Moon Sea has a long history as the border between the Elven lands to the south and the darker, more sinister lands of the Ride and Thar. Home of dragons and giant and ogre tribes in great multitudes. The deep sea was an excellent barrier to the raiders, as those tribes who sought invasion had to detour around and through the lands that would eventually hold Eulash, Zentil Keep, and Hillsfar. The first true settlement in Moonsea was North Keep. A shining citadel established as a beacon of civilization, a jumping-off point for merchants seeking trade with the dwarves of the north, including not only Tethyamar, but the clans of the Cold Lands, who traded their metalwork and crap for a much-needed magic. In the end, Northkeep was sunk beneath the icy waters of the Moon Sea by the inhuman forces, and humankind suffered one of many setbacks in the region. Oh. So has been the nature of human habitation of this region since the beginning. Human settlements strive for a few years, usually through sheer willpower, and on the strength of a sharp sword, and then are overrun by goblins or dragons, beholders, or giants. Plan has fallen and risen again. You lash is a ruin where a decade ago there was a thriving town. Holberg and Silisprin are empty hulks. Each of the cities of the Moon Sea seems threatened with extinction in its turn, then is rebuilt. Cycle may be the reason that only the strongest and the most savage survive, even prosper in the lands of the Moon Sea. The greatest cities, Hillsfar, Mole Master, and the impenetrable Zintel Heap, are all ruled by evil people who control their lands with iron grips. The lesser cities, Elven, Tree, Flan, and Thentia may be less evil, but have strong, independent, and almost chaotic nature. In many ways, the Moon Sea is a frontier with a frontier mentality. Man, this book is just kind of fucking pointless, right? At least in Witcher, they kind of talked about things that are actually relevant and just like some kind of random place that we'll probably never enter. Anyway, history of the North. Let's, let's read about this. The first flowering. Oh, kinky. For millennia, gold elves dwelt in Ilafon, where Waterdeep now stands, and air ran along the river, shining. Okay. From their ornate forest cities, they traded with emerging human nations like Netheril and Illusk, and repulsed the attacks of the goblin races. Meanwhile, dwarven clans united as a nation of Delzaun, named for the dwarf who forged the union. 
The nation, existing primarily underground, extended from the ice mountains to the nether mountains. Silver Moon Pass was its western border and the narrow sea its eastern shore. Orcs came from north of the spine of the world, but were turned back in great slaughter by the elves. To this day, this is the homeland and stronghold for orcs and similar races. Okay, that's pretty short. Let's keep it at that. What happened then? The Crown Wars. Humans immigrated in bands from the Shining Sea and up to the Sword Coast. They became seafarers, striking out across the waves of the moon chase, Minton, Rathim, and the Northern Islands. I was engaged in an increasing war against each other, with the humans and the orcs taking over the resulting ruins. Perhaps the greatest calamity to befall the fair folk was the dark disaster, a killing magic that took the form of a dark, burning cloud. That's very odd. It enshrouded the kingdom of Meatar, and when it faded away some months later, not an elf lived, nor were trees left, only an open blasted moor. The High Moor. Are you sure this isn't just talking about how our friend, uh, what's her name? Nisa? I think it's Nira, there we go, Nira. I keep, keep R and S like constantly mixing those up in names, it's kinda crazy. Maybe she just set fire to it. You never know. All was not dark for the elves. Although in retreat, as barbarian humans and orc hordes grew in strength, their power rose in the elven court and Everesca, remaining a stronghold to this day. Oh, that ended the sentence. Okay. They conceived of cooperation between dwarves, kindly humans, and other elves for mutual survival against orcs, rounding humans, and a tide of beasts. Ogres, bugbears, trolls, goblins, gnomes, and other non-human creatures. Like cockroaches and shit. Led by the rising power of giants. Astonishingly, in at least three places, the fallen kingdoms and the cities of Silvery Moon and Mithrana, they succeeded with shining grace. To the east, on the sandy shores of the calm and shining narrow sea, human fishing villages grew into small towns and then joined together as a nation of Netheril. Sages believe the fishing towns were unified by a powerful human wizard who had discovered a book of great magic power that had survived from the days of thunder, a book that legend calls the Nether Scrolls. Well, there we go. This must be uh, where the Elder Scrolls came from, right? You would think so. I'm I'm pretty sure these books are like not in this game, but something of like Dungeons and Dragons, and that's fucking old. Under this nameless wizard and those who followed, Netheril rose in power and glory, becoming both the first human land in the north and the most powerful. Some say the discovery marked the birth of human wizardry, since before then mankind had only shamans and witch doctors. For over three thousand years, Nethril dominated the north, but even its legendary wizards were unable to stop their final doom. Hmm. A history of the north, recent history of the north. Already, we're only at up to the third book. <laughs> That's, that's going fast, quick. And history books are always like that. It's like, you know, yeah, all this cool shit happened thousands of years ago. But let's just quickly skim over to the, like, recent events. And then talk, like, for ages about them. Fuck you. No, I'm not interested in the recent events. I mean, I'd realize that the recent events are actually things we know about more, so that's why they go into detail, but still... What a waste. In the waning summer months of 1367, an immense orc horde descended from the spine of the world, intent on winding its way south into the trade lands of the north. This force of orcs, led by King Renner, surged its way south between the Moonwood and the Coldwood, stopping just outside the citadel of many arrows. 
arrows. King Bald, overcruller of the Citadel of Many Arrows, was terrified at the prospect of another orc horde, despite the fact that he knew they should be working together against the humans of the north and the spawn of Hellgate Keep. What? His tribal shamans, however, had been predicting the treacherous fall of the Citadel, and they told the king that he'd be disposed by other orcs. But did he listen? Thus, it was a dark day when King Grenier and his horde of 150,000 orcs, that's a lot of orcs, appeared on the plains outside the Citadel of Many Arrows. King Abold announced to his followers that this horde had been sent to dislodge them from their home and send them out to, disc to be scavengers among the plains. He vowed that, as Grumish as his witness, the Citadel of Many Arrows would slaughter these treacherous orc like elves doing a festival. Hmm. For four months, the 40,000 orcs within the citadel held the ground. Their ground, sorry. Assault after assault was mounted against the high walls of the garrison, but the attacking orcs were losing far more than the defenders. Yeah, well, that's how, that's how it usually works. Still, the living conditions within the walls, never too good to begin with, created losses of their own. The battle for the Citadel of Many Arrows culminated during the first week of Uktar, as another light blanket of snow sought to bury the gathered orcs. King Renair threw his entire remaining army at the Citadel, bursting its gates and pitting orc against orc in a flurry of swords. As the two orc kings sought one another out along the ramparts, the Citadel began to burn. The orcs that survived the battle still speak of the extraordinary prowess of the two kings as they battled one another before their troops. Finally, Kara, King Obold ran Grenier through with his long sword, but Obold was severely wounded by the time Grenier had breathed his last breath. The orcs erupted into battle once again, and no one is quite certain what became of King Obold. It was through the smoke and snow that the victors of the conflict emerged, the dwarves of Clan Warcrown, along with, with the contingent of troops from Silvery Moon, charging in through the shattered gates. These new attackers quickly routed the exhausted orcs of the citadel, sending them scurrying off into the wilderness. King Emerus Warcrown now rules the citadel of Merry Arrows, through the to the dwarves now call the city by its old name of Felbar. Most in the north will tend to refer to the city as a citadel, however, waiting to see if it can withstand the next or horde. King Warcrown has put out a call for old dwarfs to help defend the citadel, and news of a new vein of gold and silver is spreading rapidly through Dwarven communities. Hmm. Still nothing interesting, honestly. Alright, six more books, though. We're almost there. Oh god, why are these books so fucking long? Tell the next this. This era left behind elven strongholds rife for pillaging by humans and orcs. When elves chose to leave the north and travel to Evermeet, their works quickly disappeared, leaving only places like the old road and a ruined port in the high forest to mark Erland's passing. What? Who the fuck is Erland? Why is this important? We're jumping around all over the place. And it was not only the elves who would disappear from the long-held homes, the human nation of Netheril also stood on the brink of history. Doom for Netheril came in the form of a desert, devouring the narrow sea and spreading to fill its banks with dry dust and blowing sand. Legend states that when the great wizards of Netheril realized that land was lost, they abandoned it and their countrymen, fleeing to all corners of the world and taking the secrets of wizardry with them. More likely, this was a slow migration that began 3,000 years ago and reached its conclusion 1,500 years ago. Whatever the truth, wizards no longer dwelled in Nethril. To the north, the once majestic dwarven stronghold of Delzoon fell upon hard days. Then the orcs struck. Orcs have always been foes in the north, surging out of their holes every few tens of generations when their normal haunts can no longer support their burgeoning numbers. This time they charge out of their caverns in the spine of the world, poured out of abandoned mines in the Great Peaks, screamed out of lost dwarf holes in the ice mountains, reached forth from crypt complexes in the nether mountains, and stormed upward from the bowels of the high moon mountains. What? I was expecting some kind of a w w valley, not, not a mountain, to be, you know, referred to as the bowels of it. 
or whatever. Never before since has there been such an outpouring of orcs. The Zoon crumbled before this onslaught and was driven in on itself. Netheril, without its wizard, was wiped from the face of history. The Erlan elves alone withstood the onslaught and with the aid of the trends of Turlang and other unnamed allies, were able to stave off the final days of the land for yet a few centuries more. In the east, Erlan built the fortress of Askelhorn and turned it over to refugees from Nethril as Nethres followers built the town of Kars in the high forest. The fleeing Nethres founded Lkorch and Loudwater. Others wandered the mountains, hills and moors north and west of the high forest, becoming ancestors of the Utkarth and founders of Silvery Moon, Everland and Sundabar. So we kind of went back to the past, because Silver Moon was mentioned in some other of these books. Maybe it was just mentioned in these books. Or, I don't know. The spread of humankind. Okay. The adaptable humans made use of magic they could seize or learn from the proud peoples to defeat all enemies, breaking, for a time, the power of giants and orcs. Waterdeep was founded. The last of the pure blood elves died out, a result of continued marriages with humans. In the far west, Ben also dwelt. Wise, clever primitives called the Ice Hunters. They lived simple lives on the coast since time beyond reckoning countless generations before Netheril's first founders set foot on the narrow sea's western shore. Yet this peaceful folk fell prey to another invasion from the south, crude longships that carried a tall, fair-haired, warlike race who displayed the Ice Hunters displace sorry, the ice hunters from their ancestral lands. This race, known as Northmen, spread farms and villages along the coast from the banks of the winding water to the gorges of the Mirror. Northmen warriors drove the simple ice hunters farther and farther north, forced the goblin kin back into their mountain haunts, and instigated the last council of Illifarn. Within five hundred years of the Northmen's arrival, Illifarn was no more. Its residents had migrated to Evermeet. From the coast, Northmen sailed westward, claiming and establishing colonies on the major west islands of Ruathim and Gundalurn, eventually spreading to all the islands of the Northern Sea. Others migrated northward past the spine of the world and became the truly savage barbarians of Icewind Dale. In the centuries that followed, Askelhorn became the Hellgate Keep when it fell into the hands of fiends and Erlan collapsed under the attack of a new orc horde. The elves fled southeast, joining with Northmen, Netheri's descendants and dwarves to form what is what, lay, what would later be known as the Fallen Kingdom. <laughs> that didn't go well then, I guess. This realm was short-lived and collapsed under the next orcish invasion. Though in dying, it dealt with the gob with Delta Goblin races, a blow from which they have yet to recover. Hmm. Now I'm reading this hoping that we'll find something about, you know, th at least like something close to an explanation to who the hell is assaulting us, you know, that the guy with the armor, but nothing so far. The Maidan Men. <laughs> Along the coast, in what was once the elven community of Ilfarn, humanity was once again rising in power. Merchants from the south, tribesmen from the north, and seafarers from western islands had created a village around a trading post on a deep water harbor, first known as Nimor's Hold after the Othgarth chieftain whose tribe seized and fortified the ramshackle village. Nimor and his successors, known as the Warlords, led the men of Waterdeep, as they had become known to ship captains, in a slowly losing battle against the Trolls. In a final climatic battle, the Trolls breached the aging palisade and all seemed lost until the magic of Agarn the Silvery Moon. Sorry, I've. <laughs> Agarn of Silvery Moon turned luck against the Trolls, destroying and scattering them. Agagorn, heritage of heritage and learning of Netheril, stayed in Waterdeep and in his 112th year, he saved the city again, this time from itself. In so doing, he created the Lords of Waterdeep. The city grew into the greatest in the north, possibly in all of Faroon. 
With water deep as a firm anchor, civilization forged cautiously into the wilderness. Iluskan, now Luskan, was taken from the orcs. Loudwater, Lorch, Tribor, Long Saddle, Secumber, and other towns were settled by pioneers from water deep, sponsored by water Tavian merchant families. It has been centuries since the last orc invasion. There's still constant strife. Barbarians harass merchants, travelers in towns, the seas swim with Northmen pirates, and wars have marred the land in recent years. Liscan, now a fierce merchant city known to harbor and support pirates, wage a war with the island realm of Rithim over an act of piracy against one of a few legitimate Luscan merchant ships. The war raged for nearly a year, with Rithim slowly losing ground. When it appeared Luscan would finally win uh, the naval war and land on the island itself, the Lord's Alliance entered the fray. They threatened war against Luscan if the skirmishers didn't stop immediately. Unable to fight a two-front war efficiently, Luscan concealed, cancelled sorry, its invasion plans. Probably concealed, too. <laughs> Tensions between Luskan and Rithim are still high, and their ships are often seen taking pot shots at each other as they pass, often just a wave or two away from each other. The government of Rithim has recently been sending adventurers into the hills of its island realm, looking for mercenaries who are killing merchants, farmers, and woodsmen. Rithim believes Luskan still has a presence on the island, trying to win through subversion and terrorism what it could not accomplish through war. The far north the ten towns have finished rebuilding after being nearly destroyed by the monstrous forces of Akarkasel. With help of from the Tundra barbarians living nearby, they've built and repaired their cities, replanted the sparse foliage, and most importantly replenished the morale of their citizens. A recent trader who passed through the area carrying seventeen wagons of rare oak lumber said that it was nearly impossible to determine who's a barbarian and who isn't. They're living together, he reported in amazement. Oh, God. I'm also looking for, like, familiar names of, like, places. I don't know, Nashorn, Beragost, nothing. Absolutely nothing. Useless. You have a banner. As the dwarves settled in for the winter in the reclaimed city of Pelbar, a group of centaurum sponsored adventurers broke into the Great Worm Cavern, slaying Elrim the Wise, shaman leader of the Great Worm tribe. As the tribe's warriors descended into the ranks of the evil adventurers, the Lepertation magic spirited at least three of those responsible, as well as a vast amount of treasure stolen from Elrim, to safety. According to Themrin, the tribe's present shaman Elrim promised to watch over the tribe in spirit now that my mortal form is destroyed. Despite the reassuring words of Elrim, the tribe suffered through an oppressive winter that included heavy storms, scarce game, and low morale. Trusted visitors to the barbarian encampment report that the Themrin and Gwesen Iron Hand Talistars are wearing some form of armor made from the scales of Elrim. This use of their former shaman's body as protection was supposedly ordained through a dream vision. The armor appears as little more than a supple leather armor, but seems to deflect blows and protect as well as a full plate armor. Very interesting. Nazan reported a drastic rise in the number of troll attacks in the Evermoors, and various sources confirmed that something is driving the trolls out of the moors. Whatever is behind the trolls' exodus is destined to remain a mystery for the remainder of the year, as adventuring parties expend themselves against the never-ending supply of trolls that are fleeing the bog. In the most surprising move of the year, the Blue Bear tribe, led by Shaman Chieftain Tanta Hagara, march on the fiend-ridden fortress of Hellgate Keep. While a brief struggle for political control of the city was reported by various sources, Tanta Hagara emerges the new rule of the city. Wow. Really. So, they basically went there and just, you know, got themselves selected or something. <laughs> I, th I thought it would be more like, you know, an assault against demon-ridden castle, but I guess that, you know, when fighting with demons, only demonic ways truly work, right? <laughs> ah, enough of this.
Commentary. Oh, Jesus Christ. History of Children of Mistra. The reason why Mistra, the goddess of magic, invested a portion of her divine mind in mortals is not known. One of the more popular theories, and one that is getting more support in light of the goddess's other actions during that period, is that Mistra foresaw the time of troubles in her own passing at the hands of Helm, and chose to give some of her power to mortals in order to ensure that her successor, the female mage Midnight, as it turned out, would have a number of nearly mortal allies in the struggle against the schemes of the gods, now the now dead Bane, Mirkul, and Baal. Oh dear. Those, those don't sound really good names. Who precipitated, whatever that means, the time of troubles by stealing the tablets of fate. Ugh. The theory goes on to suggest that Mithra informed Azoth at approximately the year of the Rising Flame, Zero Dystro, uh, more than 1,300 years before the time of troubles, that some of her power must be put into the hands of mortals who would then become known as Mithra's Chosen. <laughs> this sounds like uh, fucking Asher's Wrath now. Mithra! This power would sleep within the bodies of these mortals, allowing Mistra to call on it only with their permission. It would give the Chosen an innate ability to heal quickly, and would give them lifespans far greater than those of ordinary mortals. Mistra speculated that these mortals might be able to call on her power and thereby gain some special abilities, but that these powers would not rival those of a deity. See powers below. Interesting. The goddess of all magic then began to select mortals she thought to be suitable. One of the first was a young mage, Elminsta, and she also singled out a promising wizard named Kelben Aronson. Both have proved to be worthy and capable recept receptacles of her power, but Mistra's other early attempts to invest her power in living humans were unsuccessful, and she came to realize that only very few mortals were of stern enough substance to contain such power within themselves without being destroyed or corrupted. Even though some people aside from El Minster and Kelben may have possessed the requisite strength, it is possible that having lived for years prior to being visited by Mistra had set them on a path from which they were not able to deviate. Whatever the reason, the problem needed to be solved. To get around the difficulty, Mistra devised a plan to use herself as a vessel to breed individuals who could be nurtured and acclimated to her power from the very beginnings of their lives. Typical gods. For the father of these individuals, she picked the best example of human stock she could find. Oh my god, what am I reading? Dornal Silverhand, a noble man and a former harper who lived near Neverwinter, Mistra then possessed the body of Elue Shundar, a half-elven sorceress whom Dornal was already attracted to. Mistra revealed her presence and her plan to Elue, who happily and eagerly agreed to have Goddess share her body. Man, these people are into some kinky shit. Elue had been reluctant, but under the influence of Mithra, the woman became a seductress, and Dornal found his advances being suddenly returned with great fervor. Wait. First she agreed, and then she was reluctant. What the fuck? Make up your mind. Dornal and Mistra Lue were wed in the year of Drifting Stars, 760 dice rolls. The first of seven daughters, Anastra Siluna, was born the following winter. Siluna's six sisters of marriage at one year intervals thereafter. Indua Elistrail, Ambara Dove, Athena Astorma. She refers to Sword and Storm these days. Okay. Anamanue. Lero, Alasra Shentrantra, uh, known today as the Symbol, and Erese Quile. As time went on, the Mithra Elue became more senile and crazy and started giving weirder shit names to, you know, her children. And why the fuck are all of their second names different? Do you not understand how a family works? No, no, you have to just give all that random shit to everyone. Anyway, these siblings have uh, become known in Realmsian lore as the Seven Sisters. Dornal, who had been kept in the dark about his wife's true nature through the years, presumably because Mithra didn't want to risk losing his services, was disappointed and nearly destroyed by the time his sixth child was...
born. He had always wanted sons as well as daughters. More importantly, he was seeing his wife deteriorate right before his eyes. The strain of coexisting with the goddess all these years had turned the Lua into a withered shell. In a sense, a lich, clinging to life only because Mistress power was within her. Well, that's not so bad. When Alu was carrying the seventh child, Dornal consulted a priest who told him his wife had been possessed by an entity of great magical power. To spare both of them any further agony, he attempted to slay his wife's physical form by severing her head from her body. Yeah, that's not going to work against the lich. As soon as he had done this, he immediately regretted it, didn't he? <laughs> Mistra was forced to reveal herself to him, and she went to explain her scheme. Just as she had worried would happen, Dornal was aghast at how he and his wife had been used by the goddess. He turned his back on the corpse of his wife, abandoned his lands and his children, and vanished into the north. Mr. bore no bore him no ill will, and in fact protected him for the final thirty years of his life. When Dornal finally did meet his end, he called out to Mistra, and the goddess granted him continuing existence as her servant. What an asshole, seriously. Now known as the Watcher, Dornal Silverhand travels the world unseen by mortals on a continuing mission to locate candidates to swell the ranks of the Chosen and to identify possible threat to Mistra and her minions. Okay, well, this is the first person that literally is, you know, like, a person in these books. So so maybe, maybe it's the Watcher Dornal that's assaulting us. Maybe he thinks we're some kind of threat to Mistra. I don't know why we would have this idea, but then again, my life literally doubled one day. Like, that's how ridiculously overpowered I am. So, fuck it, I'll take it. And history of Thethir. For the past 1,500 years, Thethir has had single strong royal family ruling with absolute power. When a king died or became incapacitated, his oldest son took the throne, as the family trees of those close to power became more intertwined and complicated. There were the inevitable wars of succession and bickering over which second cousin was the true heir to the throne. Civil wars were brief, however, and once the fighting was over, the system returned to normal, until the next major dispute in a few hundred years or so. Oh my fucking god. This book just gets longer and longer. The established recurring cycle was broken ten years ago. The current ruling family had been in power for over 350 years, so long that they had dropped their own family name centuries ago. No one even remembers it now, and simply called themselves Thethir. King Alamander IV was comfortably ruling from Castle Thethir, and the country seemed happy enough, but there was a broad current of dissatisfaction among the people of Thethir. Non-humans were forbidden by law to own land, and since most rights and privileges accorded citizens were based on land ownership, they became second-class citizens as well. Things were especially bad for elves, who were driven deep into the forest of Thethir by royal armies. Alamander IV took land away from rightful owners and gave it to nobles who promised larger con contributions to the royal treasury. These social and economic inequities, coupled with the several harsh winters and bad harvests in Rome, made the time ripe for a change. It takes more than just a couple of lousy winters to depose a king, however. It takes treachery as well. In the case of the fall of House Tether, it took an ambitious general and an impatient royal heir. Prince Alamander grew tired of waiting for the robust Alamander IV to make room for him, so he struck a deal with General Nashram Sherbonath, commander of the king's largest army. While Sherbonath marched his uh, army toward the Thir, bringing along a sizable group of angry peasants recruited with the promise of land reform, the would-be Alamander V downplayed alarming reports from the king's spies and advisers, silencing the most persistent permanently through murder or exile. By the time her bonnet army arrived and laid siege to Castle Tethir, it was too late for loyalists to help. A Sherbonneth lounge should direct a solemn castle, using the expensive peasants as shock troops. A handful of elite soldiers let in the secret entrance by the prince with limited key cards and open the gates. At the same time, the prince, one of the few people allowed to see the king directly, would murder his father. A fire set by elite troops would destroy evidence of treachery. The general and the prince would emerge from the conflagration and announce a new joint government. 
The plan was executed perfectly, except everyone knows about it because it's written in the book, so it was only executed perfectly up to a point. Chabron had double-crossed the prince. His men were much too efficient in setting the cast ablaze. Prince Alamander, along with most of his fellow conspirators, died horribly in the fire. At about the same time, a spy planted on the general was in a stab by the equally duplicitous Alamander, murdered the general, and dissolved the body with powerful acid before anyone could come to his aid. Hmm. To make matters worse, everyone had underestimated the resentment the people felt for the royal family. Once Castle Tithier began to fall, there was no holding back the mob. In one night, the proudest, strongest castle in all the country was reduced to smoking ruin. Everything of value, fine tapestries, plates, and silverware, furniture, jewelry, weapons, clothes, armor, painting, statues, and so on, was either stolen, burned, or just ripped apart and stomped into the dust. As news of the fall of the royal family spread, so did the chaos in what is known as the Ten Black Days of Elaine. Anyone known or even suspected of blood connection to the royal family was put to the sword. This led to some darkly humorous moments as social climbers who had bragged just a week before of being a sixth cousin twice removed of a royal aunt tried in vain to convince the angry mob that they were only kidding. The nobles who were the biggest supporters of the royal family also came under attack, and some baronial keeps fell. Local leaders who had adequately distanced themselves from the Tether family, or were popular enough, or feared strong enough, survived. These surviving nobles became the initial players in the fight to decide the fate of Tethyr. One thing was certain, any leader or type of government that too closely resembled rule under the Tethyrs would not be accepted. Royalists became a dirty word in Tethyr society. The power struggle continues to this day, and there is no sign of it ending any time soon. But thankfully, the books have ended. Oh my fucking god. Actually, there might be one more book. I need to, like, check all the bodies and shit, so... Yeah. For those wondering what I'm doing... Like, you're gonna see, I will explain it in the actual video. Or possibly have already explained if this... If, if this video came out after that, and not, like, immediately following the battle... You may be confused, but you will know if you, if you watch. This method to my madness of literally carrying dead random crap. Your concern, indeed. Believe me, I would not be doing this if I had any other choice. <laughs> 